Oh, that mic is working real good. So thank you, Patrick. That, I'm always amazed if you can be in a room with so many people and there is silence. Wow, that was, that was so awesome. Uh, as Kirsty said, I'm Dr. Aaron Blight, and I am just super excited to be with you today. I have been looking forward to being with you today, and I love, love, love what you guys do. I just want to give you a hand for a minute. So give yourselves a hand for what you do as home care co-ops. I've been learning about what you do. I was not familiar with the, uh, the home care co-op model until I was invited to come to this conference. And I'm just so impressed. I think that it is a solution to some of the challenges that we have in home care. And so um, I'm just delighted to be a part of this today. And I'm looking forward to spending some time together. Um, <clears throat> the construction industry is something that's kind of ebbed and flow over, over, flowed over the last couple of years. Down the street from my house, there are images just like this. Frames going up of homes. And when you think about a framework, a framework can be a physical structure. And it's something that is happening in a home here as they're being built. But once you're inside the home, you look around and you don't really see the frame. You're not necessarily aware that it's there. You're not thinking that it's there, but it's still there. It's an important part of keeping that whole home together. But uh, a framework can be a physical structure like this. But in an abstract sense, a framework can also be a way to think about something. And I'm going to talk to you today about caregiving. And I'm hoping that the framework for caregiving that I share with you will help you to think maybe a little bit differently about caregiving than you did before. Now, I'm going to share some things. And hopefully, you'll hear some things that will be of value to you. But in addition to the things that you hear, there will be thoughts that enter your mind, some feelings that enter into your heart. And I would invite you to pay particular attention to those thoughts in your mind and those feelings in your heart, because those are coming there, coming to you for a reason. And of all the things that you hear in this presentation, those thoughts and those feelings might be the most important things for you to pay attention to. Now, on this note, I have these little cards that uh, Kirsty's gonna, Kirsten's going to help me pass out. These are these blank little cards. I'd like to make sure that everybody has one of these. And uh, the point of these cards is that today, as you hear about this framework of thinking about caregiving and your caregivers that work in your company, if there's something that comes to your mind or something that you hear, something, a feeling of your heart that you want to remember, I would invite you to write that down. Write it down on that card, and then take it back to home or to your office, and put that card somewhere that's visible, so that you can remember that one thing that you heard or felt or thought today that you wanted to remember, OK? And so if you're interested, you can take a picture of your card at the end of this presentation and send it to me. I would love to see what your cards say. You can email it to me as well. I'll give you that information at the end of the presentation. But uh, this is what Beth Ball sent to me a few years ago at a conference like this. So uh, I look forward to, to hearing what, your, what stood out to you in, in today's presentation. Just a little bit about me. Many years ago, I worked at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I was a Medicaid policy guy. National health care policy, I was writing health care policy for elderly and disabled people. If I'm being honest with you, I didn't know a whole lot about what it meant to be elderly or disabled at that time. Now, I know that you find it shocking that there might be a bureaucrat in the federal Medicaid program that doesn't know anything about being elderly or disabled and is writing policy for elderly or disabled people. But I can tell you, I was one of those people. Well, that changed when my mother-in-law suddenly was diagnosed with a brain tumor. She was given 
weeks to live. They recommended immediate brain surgery, and they said if she survived the OR, and if the surgery took its intended effect, then she might live six to nine months, best case scenario. So she went to Johns Hopkins University, uh, had this cutting edge brain surgeon that uh, cut her skull open and uh, removed the brain tumor. I'll never forget what she looked like afterwards. She looked like Frankenstein. They had shaved her head and she had staples, staples in her skull going all the way up and around. So my mother-in-law needed a place to stay to recover from brain surgery. So we invited her into our home. The extent of our analysis was mom needs help, we'll help her. She came into our home and she was supposed to stay for two weeks. She stayed for almost two years. She went through radiation, chemotherapy, a second brain surgery while she was in our home, and our lives were upended. We had a young family, four children, all under the age of eight, and we were her primary caregivers. We did this for five and a half years. She was a miracle. They wrote a, they wrote a case study about her for publication because nobody had, out, had lived this long after this brain surgery, but the problem was the residual effects of that brain surgery was causing her brain to lose its brain cells. She was in cognitive decline steadily for five and a half years for the rest of her life. She did not have dementia. She still had some sense of identity of who she was, but she couldn't function. So we were constantly, constantly helping her. Even after she moved out of our home, we were constantly going over there day and night, helping her with her activities of daily living. Near the end of her life, we were referred by hospice. The, the cancer came back, and mom decided not to pursue treatment. She had already done that, been there, done that, didn't want to do that again. And hospice referred us to a home care company, and they were a godsend for us. We just wished that we had called them sooner. They relieved us of all of the physical activities of caregiving and allowed us to focus on, really, the family relationships and the time that we had left with my mother-in-law. After she passed away, I uh, changed the course of my career. That family caregiving experience changed me. And I decided I wanted to open a home care company, just like the one that had served my mother-in-law, so I became a, a franchise owner of Home Instead Senior Care, now called Home Instead. Uh, over time, I had a couple of different uh, franchises. Over time, my company grew and grew, and we served thousands of families in the northern Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, panhandle of West Virginia. And I saw, one, one family out at a time, how universal caregiving was and how intensely personal it is at the same time. During that time, I decided to go back to school. I got my doctoral degree at GW, and I study, studied for my doctorate caregiving as a phenomenon of social science. I am not a medical doctor. My doctorate is in learning. And I like to look at caregiving as a transformative learning experience. About five years ago, I had an unsolicited offer to sell my home care business. <laughs> and uh, my wife was like, yes, do it. <laughs> and I was, I was like, I, I don't know. What, what, what am I going to do? I don't have a plan B. Like, this is home care. That was my thing, you know? But I sold. And then since then, I have been talking about caregiving to groups of family caregivers and groups of professional caregivers all over the country. I teach a few classes at Shenandoah University, and I wrote this book, When Caregiving Calls, Guidance as You Care for a Parent, Spouse, or Aging Relative. Uh, I have about 20 copies of the book here, and I will have them available if you're interested. They're $17, and I'll have them outside after the presentation is over. Uh, the book was an editor's pick by Book Life Reviews. And it's actually won some, some awards, which I think is pretty cool. It won the Best Indie Book Award for caregiving in the caregiving category. It won an Independent Publishing Book Award in the Aging, Death, and Dying category. And it was a Mom's Choice Award winner last year. 
So today as we talk about this framework for caregiving, I'm going to go through caregiving in using words that begin with the letter R. Now, the reason for focusing on, I mean, it's a little bit gimmicky to focus on R words, but the reason for focusing on R words is so that you can remember these words. If you walk out of here today and you simply remember these R words, then that's a success, <laughs> in my opinion. These R words, everything that I'm going to share with you is anchored in research. Either research on caregiving or research on adult learning applied to caregiving. And it's important for you to know that, but we're not going to be all academic. We're going to just be real and talk about the real world here. The first R word that I want to share with you is roles. In caregiving, it is imperative to understand the roles that are inherent in the caregiving relationship. So I'd like to stop for a minute and ask you, what is a role? Roles are super important to us as human beings. In social psychology, roles help us define who we are in the world. A role affects how people see you. They affect how you might see yourself. They affect where you fit in in the world. Sometimes we refer to roles as the hats that we wear. And we all have multiple hats. You might be a member of a church. You might be a Virginian or a Minnesotan. You might be a co-op member, you might be an owner, you might be a caregiver, you might be a mother, you might be a daughter, okay, all, you get the, the idea. All of these different roles are important to us in our lives, and some of the roles are more salient in how we define ourselves than others. For example, I'm talking to a group of caregivers here, right, that role caregiver might be more important to you than the role of soccer player, just as an example, right? So William Shakespeare, he was perhaps the first social psychologist. He wrote these famous world, words, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts. It's interesting that at the end of this particular poem, Shakespeare closes with one final role, the role of care receiver. There was a sociologist named Irv Goffman. He wrote a book called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. It's a seminal work in sociology. And in that book, he compares the social world to a theatrical production. And I'm going to borrow Irv Goffman's metaphor and apply it to caregiving. If caregiving was a play, the lead actor is the care receiver. The care receiver is the first person to step out on the stage. The script is written by the changing and emerging health conditions of the care receiver. The caregiver is a supporting actor. In this particular play, the caregiver is never the star of the show because the spotlight is always on the care receiver. The stage would be the home or perhaps the facility where the care receiver lives. Now here's the thing about this particular play. Neither the care receiver or the caregiver auditioned for the role. The role was thrust upon them because of the changing and emerging health condition of the care receiver. So that's an important thing to, to understand. There is no caregiver without a care receiver. The role doesn't even exist without a care receiver. So I'd like to ask you for a minute, I love asking this question, if caregiving in your organization was a play, what would be the title of your team's caregiving script? 
I'll give you a minute to think about that. And uh, we have a microphone somewhere, right? So, yes, ma'am. The Warriors. Why, why would that be the title of your team's caregiving script? Because we're on the front line if anybody else get hit. We're the fighters. Awesome. Thank you. Who else? Yes, sir. Um, when I add on, can we keep that out? That we are the heroes. The heroes. Thank you. Anyone else? What would be the title of your team's caregiving script? Yes. Serían los autores de la calle. Los autores de la calle. The authors of the street. Yes. Pueden, ex so, pueden explicar. Porque todos los días nosotros salimos eh, a diferentes sectores. Eh, nunca nos dicen qué vamos a encontrar en el escenario. Cuando entramos al escenario, eh, encontramos esta película y uno quiere alguna vez coger e irse. Porque yo alguna vez cuando llego a la casa, al escenario, yo quiero irme. Pero yo digo, esta es mi obra. Yo tengo que, yo tengo que hacerla. Yo tengo que rodar esta película y verle, no el fin, porque uno nunca le ve el fin. Nosotros los cuidadores nunca le vemos no imaginamos el fin de la película. Nosotros estamos actuando siempre. Estamos ahí con los otros actores. ¿Qué vamos a hacer? ¿Qué vamos a inventar hoy? ¿Para dónde vamos hoy? ¿Qué va a pasar hoy? ¿Qué me voy a encontrar el próximo día? Si está retirando el, el actor. Si el actor está en el suelo o está en el baño porque lo dejé activo, pero alguna vez se lo encuentro inactivo. Por eso yo le pondría... La película de la calle. <laughs> <laughs> Qué bien. So, 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 are you going to, oh, we're going to say it in English now. Yes, please do. So, I, the care receiver is the author, and we don't know what the play really is. We're not really sure what the stage is or what the film is about. And sometimes when we get there, we just want to get up and leave. Some, But we know that it's not my film but that I have to be there and I have to continue keeping those cameras rolling. And I'm not gonna be there for the end of the story either. I'm not the one who knows how the story is going to end. I have to focus on today. What's gonna happen today? What do I do today? What's going to happen tomorrow? And if I find that author on the floor or in the bathroom, I have to deal with it right now. That's why I say that we're authors from the street. Esa fue una traducción buenísima. <laughs> Gracias. All right, so that's something for you to think about. Maybe take it back to your team. Hey, if this was a play, what would be the title of our play? The second word is relationships. In caregiving, it is imperative to honor the human relationships that exist between caregiver and care receiver. Now, relationships are very important to us as human beings. Every human relationship is unique. It's comprised of person one and person two. They each bring their role to the relationship. They bring their personalities, their preferences, their likes, their dislikes, all of that stuff they bring to the relationship, and then this relationship emerges. The way that you interact with your mother for example, is probably gonna be different than the way that you interact with your boss or the way that you interact with your son or daughter or the way that you interact with your board members in your co-op, <laughs> your husband, okay? So each relationship, each human relationship, it is unique. Relationships are affected by caregiving. I'm going to share with you something called family caregiver identity theory. It comes from applied gerontology. It was the result of 28 years of research by Dr. Rhonda Montgomery and Dr. Carl Kozlowski, 
who studied family caregivers as dyads. Montgomery and Kozlowski found that family caregiving is uh, defined by a series of role-based transitions that emerge as a result of the changing health conditions of the care receiver. Now, they use a pie chart to represent this. So if there's a family caregiver, and let's say that in this case it's a wife and she's caring for her husband. Her hus over the whole history of their marriage, she's been a wife in that relationship. And being a wife has a lot of meaning. Being a wife implies actions and reactions and interpersonal conversations that are wifely. And now, because her husband has a health condition that has emerged, she might start to act a little bit differently in the relationship. In phase one of family caregiver identity theory, she may start to help her husband with a few things that he used to do. Maybe, maybe he can't pay the bills like he used to do. So now she takes up the checkbook and she's paying the bills for her husband and she may not even think about it. Like, you know, it's just, oh, he's my husband. You know, she just needs some help, I'll just help him. Well, in phase two, as the husband's health conditions decrease, or, or I'm sorry, as, as maybe the sickness or the illness increases and he has more care-related needs, she finds herself doing more and more things in sort of a caregiver role. She may or may not even realize that this is a caregiver role, but you can see how this caregiver response to the relationship is now encroaching upon the wife relationship that she has with him. In phase three, the caregiver actions and interactions in the relationship rival the wife actions and interactions in the relationship. At this point, oftentimes family caregivers experience an identity discrepancy in the relationship. They start to ask themselves, wow, like who am I in this relationship? This happens a lot with adult children. Like, okay, that's like my mom, but it's not my mom anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm not just like a daughter to her anymore. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a caregiver or like, what am I? I look at her differently. I think about her differently. And she looks at me differently too. So eventually that role identity conflict needs to be addressed. And there are some different ways that that happens and we're, we're not gonna talk about that today in the interest of time. I can talk to you about it later. It is in When Caregiving Calls, this whole uh, description of, of family caregiver identity theory. But as the needs of the care receiver continue to increase, the caregiver role overtakes the historic family role in the relationship. And the caregiver, the family caregiver, in honor of that historic family relationship and that historic family role keeps, hopefully, keeps continuing in that family caregiver response, keeps, keeps in the relationship and keeps doing things to help their loved one but there's a recognition that the relationship is different. Now, if you think about it, paid caregivers go through a similar process. Home care workers go through a similar process. If the care receiver is relatively well, then the role of the caregiver is more of companion. PCA is personal care aid. As the needs of the care receiver increase, the caregiver adapts. And the caregiver will move from being less of a companion and more, and more of a hands-on personal care assistant, doing things like all of the full care that's required that you guys know about. There's a similar process at place, in place with skilled medical professionals. Doctors. If the patient is relatively well, ah, take two pills and call me in the morning. They're more of a consultant. But as the needs of the patient increase, the doctor becomes more and more of a provider, bringing all of their knowledge and skills and hands to the work of helping that patient. 
So, I'd like to ask you a question. What is the impact of the caregiver role on your team's relationships? Thoughts? So the whole role is the whole role is caregiver. Yeah. yeah. So let's say that uh, yes, you're so you are you are hired to be a caregiver, right? So how what tell me? Let's talk about the dynamic in that relationship between the caregiver and the care receiver. So that relationship, it's, it's, it's not just physical. There's more to it than that, right? What else is, what else is in that relationship? Emotion. Tell us about that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Very well said. So there's care the noun and there's care the verb. Care the noun is having responsibility to care for another, to, to provide care to someone else. Care the verb is to like genuinely be interested in them, mm -hmm. to care about them. And my guess is the people in this room are subscribed to both, care the noun and care the verb. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. It is possible to deliver care of the noun without care of the verb. Those are those people that you don't want to hire. <laughs> yes? So you forgot somebody. You forgot the nurse. That's me. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I spent 17 years in this field doing home care. And supporting the AIDS, right? And the relationship between the nurse and the AIDS is a critical relationship. Um, yeah. I worked as a home health aide to nursing school, and so I came into the home care understanding what an aide does and the pressures. And so how does that impact the relationship? So when I walk into a case, I need to understand where that aide is in the companionship provider continuum. Yeah. I need to understand what they need from me to be successful. I need to know where do I need to be in the, okay, you got this, we're good, versus let's talk about what's going on and what you need from me. Here's some on-the-job training. So that's also part of that continuum and important relationship. Thank you. So the role of the nurse in home care is so, so important. And I don't know which states are represented here. I know that in some states, you don't have to have a registered nurse on your staff. I cannot even imagine why you wouldn't do that voluntarily because of what she just said. The, the role of the nurse is so important in training, mentoring your caregivers, being a resource to families. Thank you, thank you for bringing that up. Okay, let's go to the next R, which is realities. It is imperative in caregiving to confront the realities of the situation. Now, let's be honest. The caregiving roles are not glamorous. You think about glamorous roles like, you know, actress, rock star, scientist, teacher, Caregiver? Nobody thinks about that as a glamorous role. Even worse, care receiver. Who wants to be dependent on other people for activities of daily living? In caregiving, 
we are forced to confront marginalizing assumptions about the human body. There are assumptions that we make in our culture about the human body that are unrealistic, unfair, degrading, humiliating, embarrassing for care receivers. Because our culture tells us that, well, we're supposed to look like that. We're supposed to like, be able to do that and be like that. And the truth is, most of us don't look like that. Many of us can't do that. And our bodies, as we get older, fail. So like one of the first things that fail is your eyes, right? Your eyes fail and you get glasses, right? Your ears fail, you get a hearing aid. Your hip fails, you get a hip replacement. My wife, my wife just had a hip replacement in October. Your knees fail, you get a knee replacement. Your heart fails, you get quadruple bypass surgery. <laughs> and we talk about all these body parts as they fail. There are two, par two parts of the body that also fail that we do not talk about. <laughs> the bladder <laughs> and the bowel. Well, the mind, we, we kind of talk about the mind, but we do not talk about the bladder and the bowel. That's like taboo. <laughs> What's that? I said that was beneath us. <laughs> that was beneath us. <clears throat> well, the bladder and the bowel, they also fail. And that's just part of life. One of my very, and incontinence is one of the most stigmatizing conditions for care receivers. It can be humiliating. It makes them feel less than human. One of my favorite clients in my home care company was Mr. Henderson. He was a university professor, a learned man. He had spent his whole career at the university. And uh, he was blind. He was 89 years old when we served him. Blind man at this point. And one day, I came to visit him and I walked into his home. His wife took me to the back room where he was laying down and he heard me come in and he just sort of propped up in the bed and looked in my general direction like this. And I said, hey, Mr. Henderson, how you doing? He said, I'm incontinent. <laughs> that was it. I, I said, it's OK, Mr. Henderson, it happens. No big deal. But I thought about that later. Here's a learned man who had spent his life reading and studying and he was more concerned about his bladder than his eyes. It shouldn't be like that. As caregivers, you have the opportunity to jointly confront the stigmatizing conditions that the care receiver has. As you are training your caregivers, the new arrivals in your company, you can help them to construct a different way that's different than what our culture teaches us about the human body. This is something that I learned in my own research in home care. The more enmeshed that caregivers are in hands-on personal care, the more the role of caregiver is a job as opposed to a relationship. And this is where the organization can help caregivers to reframe and think better about the human body. Another reality that you have to confront in home care is the legal and regulatory environment of it. Is this your life? I know that the leaders of home care companies understand this sign. COVID, that was COVID right there, right? All the conflicting rules that you had to be paying attention to. Another hard reality in home care is pay. Pay is not good. It could be improved. You guys, I understand, are better at that. <laughs> this is inherent in the model of the co-op, which I love. There was a study done by a big four accounting firm about this great resignation uh, that we've just been going through. And, and the leaders of the organizations that were surveyed thought that people were leaving their jobs based on compensation, based on <laughs> benefits,
But then when they surveyed the actual workers who had exited their roles in those companies, they found that it really was not about compensation or benefits. It was about the day-to-day -day experience, the day-to-day -day lived experience of the workers. That's why they were leaving. <clears throat> Caregiving is hard. You understand this, you're caregivers. It's not just the physical, it's also emotionally hard. Physically, caregivers have to do all kinds of physical things like lift dead weight. There's a reason why caregivers have more back injuries than any other profession. You look at the workers' comp data, that's true. There's also something about caregiving that takes an emotional toll. This is what's called emotional labor. Anybody heard that term, emotional labor, before? It's actually in the literature. It's in social science. Emotional labor is when you have to regulate your emotions for the benefit of the person in front of you. So you might want to scream. <laughs> you might want to cry. You might want to flee. But you don't do any of that. You just keep yourself in check because that person in front of you it needs you to. Well, emotional labor is difficult. It takes a toll over time. There was a study of hospice workers. And it was a, an ethnographic study. And the researcher found that when the hospice workers were front stage, in front of the patients and their families, they were always professional. They kept it together. They were kind. And then as they went backstage, when they were away from the environment of patients and families, and it was just them in the break room, for example, they just kind of let their hair down. They were calloused. They cracked jokes about death and things like that. I hear a yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this was their release. It's their way of coping with the emotional labor that they are constantly, constantly dealing with. And they're just letting off, just getting it out there. Today, caregivers are reporting more stress than before. This is borne out in the research. It's, pre, it's because of COVID. It's at life after COVID. There's more diligence about you know, not, not uh, spreading infections and things like that. There are more demands for caregivers. There's less relief. There are less workers out there. All of that stuff. So it's so important for caregivers to understand that it's OK for the caregiver to be the star of the show once in a while. Sometimes caregivers become care receivers. It's important to recognize that for yourself and for your fellow caregivers in your organization. This is something that I want to share with you. How are we doing on time? Um, <clears throat> had a couple of different businesses. And in one of, one of my home care companies, I watched this happen. My scheduler slammed the phone down and said, that caregiver called off again. I can't believe it. All of our caregivers, they're terrible. They're worthless. Why did the caregivers always call out? <laughs> All of the caregivers don't always call out. It was that one that just called out. And you know, it, OK, maybe it happens every day. But 90% of the time, it works well. 10% of the time, it doesn't. But she was, the care, she was the scheduler on the right. In my other office was the scheduler on the left, Nina. It's like the honey and the vinegar, right? Nina was always about the honey. In fact, she called you honey. She loved her caregivers. And her caregivers would stop in and just talk to her about their lives, and she would listen. And you know, you know who got the caregivers to do the things that she needed done? It was the one on the left, Nina. The one that slammed the phone down couldn't get the caregivers ever to cooperate with her. So when you're dealing with your caregivers, especially the non-owner caregivers, how do they see you? Is your culture punitive? Or is it 
supportive. <clears throat> so we talk about confronting realities. In the interest of time, I'm not going to ask you, I'm not, we're not going to comment on this, but I'm going to ask you to think about this. What are the toughest realities that you face with your caregiving team today? You might be tempted to avoid those tough realities. You might want to deny, like pretend that they don't exist. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. <laughs> Address them. Use some of that, uh, that participatory consensus decision-making stuff that we just learned about. That's awesome, right? Do that. Tackle the hard stuff. It will make a difference in your organization. The next R word is rewards. In caregiving, it is imperative to cultivate the rewards that are inherent in the caregiving experience. Claire Stacy is a friend and colleague. She's at Kent State University. She said that in When Caregiving Calls, the book considers aspects often overlooked, such as the rewards that come from caregiving. She said the book is essential reading for those providing care, as well as policymakers and social scientists. It's amazing to me in the research how much of the research on caregiving focuses on the burden and the stress and the trials and the challenges associated with caregiving. And there is so little on the rewards. And yet the rewards are profound. You simply have to ask the caregivers what kind of rewards do they find in the role. For some caregivers, the pay is a reward. And that's a part of it, right? We all have to work. Um, we also can learn from the care receiver. This is one of the great things about working in home care. Esther Doble was a client of our company. She was 97 years old when we had her. And she was a painter. And one day I walked into her, into her room and she was painting this picture. <laughs> I talked to her about it, and she sold it to me. I paid $150 for that picture. And I hung it in my office. And it's a constant reminder that at 97 years old, as a person who is dependent on others for activities of daily living, she can still create something beautiful. Think of the dexterity and the attention to detail that was required for her to paint that picture. Pretty amazing. Caregivers report significant rewards from the role. In addition to learning from the care receiver, they have confidence that they are providing the best possible care to their care receiver. Caregivers report a greater sense of purpose and meaning in life. Caregiving makes you a better human being. Caregiving helps to enhance your relationships. Let's talk about paid caregivers for a minute. There's an organization called Home Care Pulse. Anybody here heard of Home Care Pulse? Okay. You're not familiar with it? Check it out. It's an industry publication. Well, they did a survey of caregivers, and they asked, well, what kind of recognition do you want from your agency? This is their response. Ranked. Ranked order. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I find it really interesting that of the top five ways that caregivers want to be recognized, three of them do not cost any money. I want to share with you a little experience that I had when I owned my home care company. This was early on. I was looking for a Christmas gift for our caregivers. And I was walking down the street in Winchester, Virginia, and there was this pewter store. I walked in and I saw this. This little thing was about this big. And I was like, oh, wow. That totally symbolizes the type of care that I want us to be providing. So I thought of buying that as a gift for our caregivers for Christmas. And then I was like, no, that's one and done. I, I got I to gotta incorporate this into the business somehow. So I don't even remember what they got for Christmas that year. But with this thing, I bought 100 of these brought them home, and I created the Hand and Heart Award. Took the pins, created these little cards, and stuck the pins on there, 
And the Hand and Heart Award was for exceptional acts of compassionate care. What's an exceptional act of compassionate care? Well, you know it when you see it. It was decidedly vague in order to be very inclusive. We announced the new Hand and Heart Award to all of our clients and their families and the referral providers in the community and all the caregivers, and the only rule was you could not invite, you could not recommend yourself for a Hand and Heart Award. <laughs> but we encouraged everybody to nominate a deserving caregiver for the new Hand and Heart Award. So about a week or two after that announcement, we got the first recommendation for a Hand and Heart Award. My HR person came to me. She said, oh, we got a nomination for the Hand and Heart Award. It's Gloria. And she had this letter from the daughter of Gloria's client. And the letter said, you know, I saw you got this new Hand and Heart Award, and I really think Gloria deserves it. And here's why. This is everything that Gloria has done for my mother. <laughs> And Gloria is like a fantastic caregiver, okay? She, you'd want her taking care of your family. And so I was like, great. So the HR person said, what are we going to do? I'm like, um, hmm, because, you know, it's crisis de jour and home care. I hadn't really thought about how we were going to do this. So I said, uh, invite, invite Gloria into the office, but don't tell her what she's coming for. So Gloria came into the office a few days later, and she's looking around like, is she in trouble? Like, what's going on here? You know, and the HR person comes to me. <laughs> And she's like, Gloria's here, Gloria's here for her Hand and Heart Award, what are we going to do? And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, I don't know. Um, let's call a meeting. <laughs> so spontaneous decision, and I just ran around the office, and whoever happened to be there, I just grabbed them and said, come here, we're going to have a meeting right now. So we got together, and we formed this little circle right here, and here was Gloria right next to me. And I had the Hand and Heart Award in an envelope, and I had the letter from the client's daughter. And all I did was I said, we gather here today to honor Gloria. Gloria is a fantastic caregiver. In fact, she is so awesome. Let me tell you what her client's daughter said about her. And so I opened up the letter, and I read what her client's daughter said. And when I was done, I looked over, and Gloria was crying. <laughs> and she immediately started gushing about how much she loves working for this company, and how much she loves her client, and how much she loves the office staff, and how meaningful this work is. And now, as Gloria's gushing, I'm looking around the circle, and now everybody in the office is crying. And they start saying how great Gloria is and how wonderful it is to have Gloria in the company and blah, blah, blah. And now I'm crying. <laughs> and there was this kumbaya moment that just happened because of a silly pewter pin and a letter from a client's daughter. And folks, it didn't cost any money. These are the rewards that are inherent in caregiving. So as I started going out and sharing this experience with organizations, I, real, I would tell the story just like that. And then I was like, you know what? We could actually just like do this from the stage or from in the organization. So when I go to clients and I'm in a, a home care company, I'll share the story just like that. And then I'll be like, you know what? We're, we're going to do one right now. And they're like, huh? And I'll say, Sally, Sally, will you come up? And this was all arranged in advance. Sally comes up. The owner of the company who nominated Sally has a letter prepared. And it's just a beautiful moment. It's like my favorite moment of the training. And it doesn't cost any money. So hallmarks of great approaches to caregiver recognition, symbolism, as humans, we love symbols. That is the beauty of that little hand and heart pewter pin. It conveys so much without saying anything. Sincerity. Whatever reward program that you have, it needs to be sincere. Don't outsource it to somebody else. Come on. That is, you can do better than that. 
simplicity. It doesn't have to be complicated. And shareability. There's something about the connectedness that happens when you share it. Uh, over the years, I gave out hundreds of hand and heart awards, and I did it the exact same way every time, and it was always touching. We started posting these things on social media. The caregivers would share them. They'd be like, look, I got this thing, you know? And uh, some caregivers had never even been recognized like this before. Again, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to leave this as a rhetorical question. But what are some of the rewards that your team has found in caregiving? And as you think about the answer to that question, think about how you can exploit that in your organization. How can you celebrate that? Because as you celebrate that, your caregivers will feel even better about being a part of your organization. Because they're not there just for a paycheck. The intrinsic meaning in caregiving is a part of why they are there. So access that. Tap into that. Use it to create a culture of caring in your organization beyond just being a business. So it's great to understand kind of these social dynamics of caregiving, roles, relationships, realities, and rewards. They're all inherent important parts of caregiving. And these are the parts of caregiving that we don't focus on. We focus so much on the tasks of caregiving because there's a never-ending task list, right? But as I was developing this model, I realized, yeah, focusing on the social aspect of caregiving is really helpful, but we have to say something about the tasks of care. And so I had to come up with another R word to encompass the tasks of caregiving. And it had to be a word that begins with the letter R. So I came up with the word readiness. Readiness encompasses the caregiver's ability to deliver on the tasks of care whenever and wherever the care receiver needs help. The way to become ready to deliver on the tasks of care is through practice. There was a study of workers that were in a dementia care unit in Australia. And this uh, learning theorist, the researcher, found that these caregivers, they had no formal training in, in managing dementia-related behaviors, but they came up with their own way of establishing order in their environment and supporting their clients through a process of showing, guessing, and trying. Showing, guessing, and trying. In other words, it was just trial and error. You try something, and it doesn't work, so you try something else. And maybe that works a little bit better, but you tweak it. And you try it, and you tweak it, and you try it, and you tweak it, and eventually, you guess, and you get something, and it works. <laughs> and this is what caregivers do. So as you practice with each individual client, you get better at providing care and meeting their needs. So when you're training your caregivers, Look at it as a practice opportunity. Each client is different. Each client is unique. And that process of showing, guessing, and trying will help your caregivers to look at their job as a learning experience. And it helps you to feel confident when you don't do it right, because you can do it better next time. I bet if you reflected on your caregivers and the tasks of caregiving, you'll think of a lot of things that they became better at doing, or you became better at doing, only through practice. One example, which I think is really interesting, I learned this not too long ago, is that in occupational therapy, one of the hardest things to do is to have a mobility-impaired person get in and out of the car. Like in occupational therapy, that's like a huge thing. And you think about like, what's the first thing that's done with that patient when they're discharged from the hospital? <laughs> in a car, yeah, you're doing it right there. Hardest occupational care therapy thing to do. Understanding roles, honoring relationships, confronting realities, cultivating rewards, practicing for readiness. This is the framework that I wanted to share with you. It's a way of thinking about caregiving and it's a framework that you can use for hiring and for retention of your caregivers. In addition to the co-op motivation of ownership, which is awesome, <laughs> 
as you are looking at potential applicants, potential caregivers for your company, ask them questions around these R-related words. Ask them, what, what does the role of caregiver mean to you? Tell me about a relationship that you had with someone that you cared for. How did the caregiver role affect that relationship? Tell me about one of the hard realities of caregiving that you've had to deal with. What are some of the rewards that you've found in serving as a caregiver? The smile. You, the you, smile from the client. Yeah. It's beautiful. So oh, if, yeah. If, if I was interviewing somebody and they just said that, yeah. just that right there, I'd be like, yes. hire her right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay? So the, you see where I'm going with this. Forget all those, like, pre-populated questions that are like, when's your availability? And Okay, you want to hire somebody that's got it right here, right? That understands it. And these questions will elicit that type of response. In terms of your training, your ongoing training, when the caregiver doesn't do the job right, do you just lower the ax? <laughs> or do you say, you know what? This is a learning opportunity, practice, we get better. Your culture, developing your organizational culture. You can use these R words to cultivate a great organizational culture that will make people want to stay. Jennifer Martin, Chief Nursing Officer at Blue Ridge Hospice, said that the book was written with passion and wisdom. She said, personal and professional caregivers, it's a must read. Um, over time. So th these are the 18 chapters in the book. All right, back to those little cards. Those little cards that you have in front of you. What is one thing that you're going to do, that you're going to remember, that you're going to do as a result of today's presentation? Please take a moment and write that on your card. And then take it home, bring it to your office, stick it in your purse, stick it in your wallet, put it on your mirror, whatever, but use that to remember how you can improve your recruitment and retention efforts with your caregivers. If you are so inclined, please share with me your card. I'd love to, love to see or hear what you think about it. Oh, my, my email's not on that slide, is it? Oops. <laughs> it's Aaron at caregivingkinetics.com. Thank you for what you do every day. You are making a difference, and I love what you do. Thank you for inviting me to be here.